Today, we are coming here to discuss memory hierarchy. What is the memory hierarchy and how does the memory hierarchy come into the architecture of a particular computer? So that is what we are going to discuss today. Now, in discussing this topic, over here, I have the processor memory performance gap. And there is something we would need to acknowledge over here, that since the whole computer game came up, year upon year upon year upon year, we've seen that there has been a doubling or an increase in capacity in the performance of the processor compared to the memory, it's like the processor doubles every single year. So every year it goes 2x, 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 and it continues to grow. But for the memory, there has been no such growth. It's very slow. The growth of the memory's performance has not gotten to the limit of the processor. Now, we evaluate this understanding because according to Moore's law, we get a 2x growth in processor speed every 1.5 years. That means that to be honest with you, if you bought, a, a, let's say a phone or a computer two years ago, the computer that is being used now is two times faster in terms of processing speed than the computer you bought two years ago. But the memory's performance is basically the same or there hasn't been any significant growth in that area. So we keep that in mind. That means that for the memory, there is no much growth there. There's no much improvement there over the years. It's basically stayed the same. There have been new technologies here and there, but it's basically stayed the same. So what are the facts that we deal with when we talk about memory hierarchy? The first fact is that large memories are slow and fast memories are small. Let's break this point down again. When I have my memory pyramid, so over here I have a memory pyramid. The memory pyramid looks at the secondary memory. The secondary memory here is what we refer to as our hard disk or our SSD RAM. All of those things form part of our secondary memory. Then we have our main memory, the RAM in your computer, is what we refer to as the main memory. Then we have the second level cache. Then all the things here form part of the first level cache. So when we say the memory hierarchy, we have one, or let me use the, the light pointer, so we have one, two, three, and four. And we are saying that, first fact, large memories are slow. That means that the secondary memory compared to the main memory, the main memory is faster than the secondary memory. The second level cache is faster than the main memory. And the caches we have here are faster than the second level cache. Also, they are slower, meaning that the speed of transfer from data between the processor and then this, and then the processor and the second level cache, and the processor and the memory, the more you get closer to the processor, so from here, I'll go here, and I'll come here, and I'll come here, I'll come here, then I'll go into the processor and have a cache there as the, uh, the, the register, then I'll come in here. The speed at which these are able to take information and give back information is far faster when we go down and we get closer to the CPU or the processor. So as we move closer to the processor, I am faster, the amount of data I can store is smaller and my size gets smaller the closer I come 
to the CPU. Now, how do we create a memory that gives the illusion of being larger, cheap, and faster? For most of the time, we do it with the hierarchy and we're dealing with parallelism. So let me ask a question here. And this question anyone can answer, anyone who thinks he can answer. And by the way, I told the earlier class, so I have to tell you people here. When you are joining the class, um, there are some facts in which we need to get out of the way. I don't ask questions because um, I want to hear from you. I ask questions because in IT, the more you can express yourself, the more you can see where you are getting right and wrong. So the less you express yourself, the less good you become. That's number one. Number two, hearing from you knows you are paying attention. It gives me the ability to note your name down and stuff so that if it gets to a critical point in which I have to give consideration to you, I would watch and say, okay, I know this student, ID 444. Oh, okay, let me consider him because he has been contributing. That means that if you join these Zoom classes like Amos, Jeremy, uh, uh, Alo, uh, Mawonyo's phone, Marshall, Pearl, without your index numbers, when I ask questions and you answer, I don't give you any marks and I don't take notice of you. I have to be very clear. So when you are joining, join with your index numbers. The next one too is that 30 minutes into the class, I take attendance. I have a software which I can just use to take attendance of the people who are there. And if your index number is not there, you get an attendance of zero. So please keep note of these things as we go along. Now, the question is this. If I have a room, the room is the size of the class in which we, um, we did last week. That, that, that's the size of the class, okay? And then I have uh, another room. That room is... It's like a hostel room, very small, let's say four in a room kind of room, you know, that kind of thing. And then all of the rooms are filled. All of them have beds and TV and all of those stuff. And uh, I lost my uh, ear, ear pods. So I'm looking for my ear pods, right? Two things. My ear pods are not in the case. Are we okay? So I'm looking for the ear pods. Not the case, just the airports, but they are in the room somewhere. Are we okay? Which room will I find it first? The room which is bigger or the room which is smaller? Who can tell me? The, the, room, which is the room that is smaller. Okay. Yes. So with common rationale, common understanding, um, we can say the room that is smaller. Okay, that's fine. Now, if I find it, let's say I find the earbuds um, on the bed, okay? And now I remember, oh, I have to charge it all. So I need the, the pod that it, it contains the earbuds. Um, where do you think I will find it? You were never, you said you were never looking for it. Because you're only oh, looking for a single earbud. I was only looking for mm -hmm. the earphones. Great. Yes. I have found the earphones. And I realized, oh, no, um, I'm going to go out. And when I go out, I'll probably have to charge it. You understand? So now I'm looking for the pods, right? Where do you think I will find it? If I found the, the earbuds on the bed, where do you think I'll find the pod? Also on the bed. Yes. It makes sense that it would be also on the bed or yeah. under the bed or on the floor closer to the bed or on the table next to the bed, right? So let's keep that in mind as we go on. I'll refer to this analogy as we go on. So as I said, based on the pyramid of data that we have, we can see that our memory hierarchy is based on a pyramid. And this pyramid allows us to show memory by showing the L1, L2, 
main memory and secondary memory. Remember, the secondary memory is what we refer to as our hard disk, um, our SSD drive. All of those things, we term them as secondary memory. The main memory is the RAM that is in our computer. And then we have the level two cache and the level one caches. At the top here, I showed you a diagram of them whereby the first square here shows you the level one cache. Here is the level two cache. Here is the uh, 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 main memory. And then of course, the diagram we have here becomes a secondary uh, memory. Is that okay? Now, looking at this again, we can see that based on the pyramid, the more I go away from the processor, the bigger I am. That means that the more you are away from the processor, the more data you can store. Also, the closer you get to the processor, the less data you can store. Why is this important? Why is the amount of data I can store smaller the closer I get to the processor? Who can take a shot at it? Why is it that I don't just go and give my processor or my main memory? Like, since you were born, when you ever heard people talk about computer, they said, oh, I have two gig, I have four gig, I have six gig, I have 10 gig, eight, I have uh, eight gig, I have 16 gig, so on and so forth. Why have you never heard someone say, I have one terabyte as my main memory? Why have you never heard that? Why is it that the closer you get to the processor, the amount of data you store in the cache very, very small? Kelvin. Kelvin is, mm -hmm. if um the memory is bigger when it gets close to the processing, it makes the, when it gets closer to the processor, it makes processing difficult because um the processor getting its hand on information like becomes more difficult because of the big space it has. Very very good attempt, Kelvin. Very very good attempt. And that is why I asked you the question about the big room and the small room. If the room is bigger and I'm looking for something, I take longer because there are a lot more places for me to look at. If the room is smaller, I take lesser time because the rooms to look for are smaller. But the fact that it is smaller, I can make it more faster and more compact, hence improving the way in which I can communicate and look for things back and forth. very important. So that is why it gets smaller as it goes closer. The amount of data we can store gets closer. So looking at this again, increasing distance from the processor in access time. That means that if I need information and the information is in my main memory, the time it would take me to access the information and come back to the processor. So for me to go here and come back, and the time it takes me to go to the L2 and come back, the time it takes me to go to L1 and come back. Obviously, me going here and here, and me going to L1 and coming back is going to be far faster than me going from the processor all the way to main memory, and then I come back to the processor. So the closer you are, the faster the communication is with the processor. That should make sense. We have talked about the size already. The more I go further away from the processor, the bigger I can store data. But the more I can store data, the slower I am because I do not, I am not involved in the processing of data experience with the processor. What is in L1 is a subset of what is in L2 cache. And it's a subset of what is in main memory. That is a subset of what is in secondary memory. Let's discuss this. If I have a hard disk, my information is on my hard disk. That means that before I can access the information on the hard disk, it has to be loaded onto the main memory. 
a copy of that data is loaded from main memory into L2 cache. A copy is also sent from L2 cache to L1 cache, and then it will be sent to the processor. Why does this happen? Why do we do this? Why do we create copies of them throughout the whole process till it gets to the processor? Why do we do this? And we do this because of, oh, we haven't gotten there. It's because of this, um, the principle of locality. But before we go and talk about the principle of locality, let us go through all of these slides and then get there. So just like we did for the CPU, and we talked about performance. With memory too, there is performance. And there has to be a way where we can quantify performance. The first kind of performance we measure is latency. And we talk about latency, we are talking about time. And we are talking about the time to access a word or a piece of data. So access time refers to the time between the request and when the data is available. So when the CPU requires some piece of data and it says, oh, bring me this data, the time it takes it for it to say, oh, bring me this data till the time it gets the data that it is looking for is what we are calling access time. Cycle time refers to the time between requests. Usually cycle time is greater than access time. So. If I send a piece of information and I come back, the next piece of information I'm going to send, how long did it take between them? Is what I'm looking at as what? Cycle time. Typical read access times for an SRAM in 2024 is two to four nanoseconds, and the fastest pass to eight to 20 nanoseconds. So obviously, in this Millennium, we are in the speeds are far, far more faster than this. When we say bandwidth, then we are not talking about time anymore, but we are talking about data, how much data goes through something. So when I say bandwidth, I'm looking at how much data from memory can be supplied to the processor per unit time. That is why sometimes you'll be having a conversation with people and they'll say, my network is very slow. Technically, they are talking about their bandwidth. So the actual word they should say is, my bandwidth is very low as an IT person. Because it means that the amount of data you are getting on your phone is, let's say, 50 megabytes per second. Obviously, if you want your videos to load fast, if you want your Netflix to be enjoyable, if you want your gameplay to be great, if you want your songs to stream nicely, then you need to have, let's say, 2 meg per second or 4 meg per second or even for the school, for example, we are running around 60 meg per second. Of course, a lot of people are on it, so on and so forth. But the amount of data you are getting now per second counts to how fast you'll be doing something. In which, in, in, in a, a good scenario of this is, if I am packing things from, and let's say I'm packing, uh, uh, what do we call that? Uh, pure water, yeah? I'm packing pure water and I'm taking it one by one. Obviously, if you are packing it like those guys who come and supply pure water and they have like four bags or 10 bags on their back and all of those things, they would be faster than you. Even if you run and go and do it or whatever, because the amount of data they are, they are, they are picking and going back and forth with is large, they can load the data faster than you can do it. So if I'm looking at performance, if the amount of data you can load is huge per second. And the time it takes you to do something is also very small. Then obviously you are going to be very fast and your performance is going to be very good. Do we understand these matrices? Yes, sir. When we meet um, next week, we'll have the second part of this lecture and that will focus only on the calculations that have come in, in memory hierarchy. But for this week, we are dealing with the theoretical stuff since we are on. Now in that time, okay, we don't need these things. And we have already done the review of this. We know what L1 caches, we know what L2 caches, we know what main memory is and so on and so forth. So we know what all of these are. So let's talk about the principle of locality. 
And that goes to what I asked you about the earbuds. If you are looking for something, when you find what you are looking for, there is a high tendency that you would um, go in for something um, close to where you found the thing. Let me give you out-of-world examples, close to what we are doing examples, and then we'll come to the technical examples. As human beings, um, around 70% of people find their significant other, their marriage partner or whatever, either from work or from school. Why do you think that is so? Because the time you spend, the most time you spend is in work or in school. That means technically the pool of people you would date, the pool of people you choose from, the pool of people you form your perspective with, the amount of people you say, oh, I like him, I don't like him. Those things you would create come from the pool you are in, which is work or school. So a lot of people will get married to people who are, I went to school with him, I have been him where I worked at this place before, that kind of a thing. Also goes in for dating, whereby the person will date two or three people from the same vicinity. Why? Because he has dated one person there, it didn't go well, but he's still there, he has some majority there, so he continues to date there. Let's come to the kitchen. Whenever you are cooking, and um, those guys who have cooked before and all of those things, if you have cooked before, you realize that normally where the salt is, the pepper is, and where the pepper is, the spices are. Because when you are cooking and you put in the salt, the next thing you would obviously do is put in the pepper. So it makes no sense that the pepper and the salt are not at the same location. And it also brings to the point that if you take the salt and you put it in and you put it back, there is a high likelihood that you would go in for the salt again. And remember what I'm saying, that you go for the salt again because maybe the taste wasn't up to, so you have to top it up. In our browser life, where we have our computers, When we open a particular site, especially if you are using Chrome, why Chrome is so heavy and why Chrome takes so much memory space and why when you use Chrome, it makes your computer very, very slow is because when you open a particular site with Chrome, Chrome decides that since you have opened this site, there is a high likelihood that you go to site B, C, D. Hence, I will go and load site B, C, D onto your computer already and wait for you to click. And when you click, because it is already there, it will load faster. So you realize that the first site you would go to, it will take a while for it to load. In that site, when you go to other pages, they load faster because those pages have already been loaded onto your computer waiting for you to click on. The law or the principle of locality allows us or allows us to uh, program access a relatively small portion of address space of any instance of time. There are two types. Now, the first type deals with the locality in time. The locality in time is if an item is referenced, for example, the salt, it will tend to be referenced again very soon. So if I add salt, the tendency for me to add more is very high because everybody will add small taste and then top up a bit. The same way with a program. If you use a particular program and it is done doing what it's supposed to do, there is a high tendency that that program would be used again. 
Let's keep that in mind. The second form of locality deals with space. And here we are saying that if an item is referenced, items whose addresses are close by tend to be referenced very soon. For example, a straight line code or an array. So practically, Let's see if I can explain what I'm doing with this diagram here. Now in this diagram here, I am saying the following. Over here I have the CPU. Our CPU is going to be colored as blue. Our cache is going to be colored as green. Oh. I have to make the cache another color. So let me make the cache uh, brown. And then our memory is going to be green. Now, let's imagine a world in which Mr. Cash here does not exist. So we have a world in which cash doesn't exist. So I'm going to remove cash from the equation by just scrolling down and getting up to here. And then I'll come above here and copy all the things I have here and scroll down again when it disappears, then I'll just paste it over here. So at this stage, our cash does not exist. Now, if I need or the CPU requires information, it will go to memory. Go and look through all the spots in memory. So I'll look through here, 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 here. And let's say I look through and I find the information over here. Then I will send the information I find here to the CPU, do what it has to do. Now, if I have to go back and look for something again, then look, I have to go and look through all of these things. Remember, the computer doesn't know what it is looking for. You as the human being can see the boxes from the top. But imagine a situation where you have boxes, you don't know what is in the boxes. You have to open them to find out what is there and close them. And go and come back, open the next one, open the next one, close it. So you don't know what is there. All you know is that there is something there you are finding using the addresses. So this is the setup of the computer. Now, we are saying that this doesn't make sense because if you go and load the five, the likelihood you go back here and pick the five again is very, very high. So the cache system allows me to say that, okay, if I'm picking five from here, then when I'm coming back to the CPU, I'll put the five over here and then I'll give the CPU five. So that the next time, if I need that piece of information again, instead of me going to the main memory to go and pick it up, I'll go to the cache and pick it up and then deal with the cache from here on. So that I don't have to go this whole distance and get to main memory before I come back. Also, I'm also saying that when I go and I find the item here, all the items around it, I will pick it and bring it into cash so that if I don't find what is here, and I, if I come back here and I pick five and I bring it here, logically, I would need something around it. I would need the pepper. I would need the spices. So why don't I pick all the things that are around what I am taking so that if I require something around it, there is no need for me to come and look for it over here, but I can find what I'm looking for over here so that I can just use it here. So those are the principles of locality. Any questions? Uh, 
Are we all okay? Easy, you have failed. Oh. So if you don't understand, tell me. So I'll go over. Or I'll say it again. Excuse me, sir. But is it only Chrome that does this type of process? Um, to be honest with you, now most of the browsers do this because most of the browsers use there's something called Chromium. So, for example, if you want to use your own browser, you can um, download Chromium and then build your browser. So, Edge, for example, is built on the Chromium uh, 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 kernel. So it behaves like Chrome because it uses the core features of Chrome. But all modern day browsers do this, not just Chrome, uh, Firefox, um, Opera, all modern day browsers tend to load or preload information into your computer. So if you open, if you go into your computer, for example, and here, I have not, okay, just for your sake, I've opened Chrome. So this is Chrome. And then I open Chrome up, right? So now Chrome is open. See how many things Chrome opened for me in the background. I've opened one page. I, I've not even... I've not even logged into it yet. So it's now um, I click for it to log into it. Now, when you log into it, look at the amount of things Chrome has created for me, right? This thing here is a background information being loaded. So it is just waiting for me. And that is why for some of you who use like a four gig computer or a two gig computer, you don't use Chrome. Because if you use Chrome, your computer will be slow because it does not have the memory capacities to handle what you're doing. At this current stage, I'm using 87% of my CPU and I'm using 97% of my memory. And I'm running, um, my computer is running at 12 gig. So me running at 12 gig, I'm running near full capacity just because I opened Chrome. And as you can see, I am talking to you, haven't clicked anything, haven't typed everything, haven't pressed anything, but look at the things which are opening in the background. Now, if I am to go and then tell Chrome to go away, so I'm to end it, immediately I end Chrome, we can see the recovery I'm getting with my CPU and my memory. Are we okay? Do we understand? Yes, sir. When I say, when I talk about Memory hierarchy, there are some terminology, term, terminologies in which I need to know. And what are these things? I need to know what is a hit. So when I say something is a hit, what is it? When I say something is a miss, what is it? What is a hit? What is a miss? A hit is that data is in a same block in the upper level. Two. So, when I am looking for information, when I'm looking for information from here, and I come in here and I'm looking for the information. It is a hit if I find it. So if I find, let's say, what I'm looking for, I'm looking for three. If I find the three here, I have a hit. 
If I look through all of this and I don't find it, it means that I have to go and load that piece of information from the secondary A, from the secondary memory. So I have to go and pick it from here and then bring it back here. Me doing that means I have a miss. So it, data is not in the upper level, so it needs to be retrieved from a block in the lower level. Then I have a miss. The hit rate is the fraction of memory access from, sorry, is the fraction of memory access found in the upper level. The hit miss is the hit minus the miss rate. Please give me one second, I'm coming, okay? I am so, so sorry. There was a web call. I couldn't get off the web call. So that is a cash miss. So the amount of, or the ratio of how many times do I find it to how many times I don't find it. Meaning, when I am, when I am here, when I am here, how many, when I'm looking for something here, how many times do I find it? Okay, let's say I find it four times. Ooh, I find it, let's, let's say I find it um, seven to eight times. How many times do I get a miss? Let's say I get a miss three times. So how many times do I look for it in total? I look for it in total um, 11 times. That means the ratio of how many times I did it to how many times in which I got a hit would be eight divided by 11, which would give me uh, a hit ratio of, let's say, 0 0.8, give or take. Now, this ratio here, for me to know the miss, that means that I'm going to do one minus 0 0.8. That means my miss ratio is going to be, sorry. Yeah, man minus one minus 0 0.8. That means my miss ratio is going to be, it's supposed to be 0 0.1. That be the mass quality here coming. So it's equal to one minus this. Oh. So it's going to be 0 0.2, good. So from here, what you are trying to tell you that if you calculate the hit ratio over here, the hit rate, then you come and subtract one minus eight to get the miss rate. The hit rate is 
how many times the thing I'm looking for, how many times do I find it against the number of times I have looked for it? So obviously, if I'm looking at the miss rate, it is how many times in which I didn't find it. The easier way to do it is to know how many times I found something, the rate of it, and subtract it by one. So that will give you your miss rate. Now, your hit time is the time that it takes you to access the upper level, which consists of the RAM access plus the time to determine a hit or a miss. That is, if I am doing the hit time, practically, I'm looking at it like this. This CPU here is looking for something. The time it takes it to go here, not find, come here, not find, go here, find, and then come here, that is not it. The hit rate is the time it takes me to go here, come here, get up to here, and then determine that the thing in which I'm looking for, I cannot find. Now, why is that word very important? Because over here, Remember, the computer has to look here, 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 and then look through all of them before it can tell you that, oh, I did not find it. So until it looks through all of them, finishes, and then comes to the realization that, okay, the thing I'm looking for is not there, then you have a hit time or a miss time. So over here, it in consists of the RAM access time, so the time it access you to access the RAM and look through, and also the time it takes for you to determine a hit or a miss. So after I have looked through, there are some seconds that there are some. There's a time frame. It's not seconds. It's nanoseconds anyway. But there is a time frame that it takes it to determine if the thing I am looking for did I find it or did I not find it. Remember, the computer has no knowledge on anything. That means that any knowledge it has, you are the one providing. So there has to be code there that will tell the computer that, okay, since you've gone through everything and it wasn't there, then you have a miss. So if you have a miss, now go to the lower level memory and go and look for the thing you are looking for. Do we have an understanding? So for memory hierarchy, there are four questions in which we need to answer ourselves. We'll answer most of these things when we see ourselves face to face, but let's know what questions we'll ask ourselves when we see ourselves face to face. Where can a block be placed in the upper level? How is a block found if it is in the upper level? Which block should be replaced on a miss? And what happens on a right? So, Let's have a discussion on this in terms of what we have over here. Now, if I have this setup here, right? Ideally, if I require some piece of information, I will come to the cache. That has been established. After I leave the cache, I will come to the main memory. I will look through, I'll find the thing I'm looking for. Say I'm looking for one. I have found one. When I'm going back to the CPU, I will go to the cache. I'll put the one I found over here, just in case it will require it in the future for another computation or do something again, just in case. Then I'll take the thing to the CPU to do what it has to do. The CPU is going to count this one till it gets to five. Over here, I have a question to ask myself. The question is this. If this figure here changes to two, do I go here and change this to two and come here and change it also to two? Or when this figure here changes to two, Do I just change it to two in the cache and leave this one? So that over here, if it changes to three, 
This will also change to three when it changes to four. This will also change to four. But when it changes to five, then here will change to five. And because five is the result we are looking for over here, we'll come and change it to what? Five. So in the first way, every step, all of them will be updated. In the second way, we are looking at the communication between the CPU and the cache till our result is gotten before we come and change it in the main memory. To you, which approach do you think the computer will take? Hell, are you talking to someone or are you talking to us? I can see that I, the only way I can get answers is if I ask people questions. So, Clement, to... what will you do? Clement didn't unmute, so we'll give Clement minus two and continue. Foster, what will you do? Oh, sorry, Fraser. What will you do, Fraser? It do appear. Fraser didn't unmute, so we'll give Fraser minus two and continue. Derek Benser, what will you do? Derek did not unmute, so we'll give Derek minus two and continue. Kelvin, wow. No, sir, sir, sir. Uh-huh. Sir, please, I didn't hear my name when you asked the first time. Need to know, is there another person called Derek Meza? So, like, no, sir, like, the first time you mentioned my name, I didn't hear it until you said Okay, what will you do? It's for the second time. Sir, please, I think... The computer will maintain, no, it's rather change the numbers so that it will be easier for it to find it. So you think it will do a complete change, right? Okay, we have one view from Derek. Yes, sir. We have one view from Derek. So yeah. You have a question. What's your question? You can let us only take one like number. And the what? And let us take only one number. I, I can't hear the, the thing before the one number. And the cash take only one number. No, 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 no. The cash, you see all the you see over here I have one, like the boxes have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, do you understand? Yeah. To be honest with you, the cache does not take information like this. So I am only using this to il uh, illustrate that the cache is, the memory is in blocks like this. The cache is also in blocks like this, but it is smaller than the memory. So I just did it smaller like this so that you see this. But technically, it is not taking in only one value. Over here too can be another value. Over here can be another value then down here can be another value because they are all blocks that information can be seen. To be honest with you, where is this? To be honest with you, um, we are looking at something like this. So over here, this is how it looks like practically. Right, so this is how a cache hit and a cache miss is uh, miss is determined. As I said, we'll do that practically next week because next week we'll do a lot of um, calculations and diagrams and so on and so forth. But this is how it looks like. So once you go and then take the data, the data is divided. Then we will have the tag, the set, and then the off. The tag and the set and the off will help you to load the data into the 
the, the application so that you can respond to the CPU. So when there is a hit, as you can see, it goes, looks for the data. If it finds it, then there is a hit. If it doesn't find it, there is a miss. If there is a hit, then it loads the data and sends it to the CPU. So technically, this is how it looks like, right? The only reason why I'm using the Excel is so that you know that, okay, this is memory, this is how it stores data. The data is pushed here, then it is pushed to the CPU, so on and so forth. But in terms of the information that it is taking, it does not even take um, like nine, five, one, and all of those things. It's, it's binary. So ones and zeros. So it will take zero ones and zeros. Do you understand? So um, do not get uh, bogged down as to if it will take five, one, and two. The only thing is that these spots here are to let you know that it is like a shelf that is saving information, but it is smaller than the main memory. Are we okay? Now, again, when it is doing it right back and then it's true uh, right out, what where do you think the computer, what way do you think it's more efficient? Whenever there is a change in memory, should the cache be changed and the C CPU be changed? So whenever the CPU makes a change, should it update all of them that, okay, I've made a change, or, or it will only tell the memory I've made a change when it is done? Which one do you think is more efficient? So please, can you repeat your question? I... If I have data in my computer's memory, so in this case, I have eight here, right? So that's the data I have. When I am sending the data to the CPU, I will put that data in the cache for all the reasons in which so that it can be quickly assessed, it can be quickly fetched, it can be quickly uh, uh, taken. I'll even put the other pieces of data around it. So let's say here I have data around it over here. I will actually pick the data around it and the eight and take all of those information here so that if it has any day need for any data around the eight, it can also go and take it and use it for what it will do. Now, if the computer picks the eight and the computer is, let's say, counting the eight, so it will count the eight from nine till it gets to 10. When this value here changes to nine, ideally, the cache here should also change to nine. And then the data here in memory should also change to what, nine? Or, or before I go to the or, then the computer will change this eight here to 10. That means that the information here will also change from 8 to 10, and the result over here will also change from 9 to what, 10. So that at all times, any place, the data is what, updated. Or should the computer just ignore the main memory and focus on the cache and change here to 9? Then when it changes here to 10, it will change here to 10 to you. But at this place, the computer has done its job. It's changing, it's counting from 8 to 10. So now that you have gotten a result, then it will go and tell main memory that, okay, now change from eight to what? 10. Which operation here do you think is better? Uh, the first or the second, uh, and why? The, uh, yep. Yeah. I think it would be better if it tells the memory like after everything, because if, it has to go back and forth every time, which will be slower. It will be slower. Okay. So we have two people saying that the first one is the way to go. Are there any views? Anybody also has any other views? Yeah, I would um I think um maybe a CPU going to the 10, then before it announces to the main memory and secondary memory that it's rich then, which will update both of them. That will be much faster because if the CPU um, updates the cache and the main memory every time, like after every update, it will be slower because we're going back and forth, back and forth. So it should rather finish its counting 
before updating the cache and their main memory. Mm. So let's see which one is better, right? Let's see. We have two views. People have expressed their view, given their points of view. Now, the first two questions over here. Where can a block be placed in upper level? So if I go and pick some information, where can I place it? And how is a block found if it is in upper level? So where can I go and go and look for the information I am looking for? We use direct mapping, set associative mapping and full associative mapping to do the finding and the blocking and the comparison and all of that. All of this, we will do it next week. The next thing. So all here, we show you the, the uh, fully associative mapping and how the mapping is done and all of those things. We'll do mode. By the way, what is MOD? Twelve mode eight. What is mode? Mode access in range. As you ask, access the range. Range. There's no range. Modular. Say, modular. modular. What does modular mean? In mass, if I say modular, what does it mean? Say. Uh-huh. Say it's act, it's it acts as the reminder when one integer is divided by another. Very good. So the remainder. So as I said, there is a whole calculation that deals with moving data, memory, and all of those things. And we'll look at it when we are all together and I can see your face and see if you are understanding or not. So we will look at that. We'll also look at how we create an address, how we pick an address for main memory and then create the address for a tag. As you can see, we have this. And I, I try to show you that effect over here in this diagram here. So that if you have data, when you go and pick the address from uh, memory, you go and pick the address of the item you bring it to, I pick the address, okay? There is a miss, so I pick the address. Then when I bring the address here, the address will be broken down into a tag and a set. And then when it is broken down, that information will be loaded into cache. Then we'll get data and the data will be brought from memory in here. So we will see how this whole process is done, the calculation, how it is done, how, what goes into that. And that goes into the block address and how the block address is divided into the tag and the index. How do we get a tag? How do we get an index? What is the tag? What is the index? So on and so forth. The third question over there deals with what happens on a right. And here we can discuss that. So right through, the information is written to both the block in cache and to the block in the lower level of the memory hierarchy. So that is the first example we said, where two people said that that is the best way to go because when I make a change, I should send the change throughout my program. For the right back, we are saying that the information is only to the block in the cache. The modified cache block is written to main memory only when it is replaced. And that is the example I gave. So the cache and the, C, the processor will talk to themselves. When you are done and you are fully sure, then you go and tell the memory what result you have. So there are pros and cons on each. What are the pros and cons of each one? For the write through, read misses don't result in writes. So it is simpler and cheaper. For write backs, repeated, repeated writes require only one write to the lower level. Also, there needs to be a way where you can keep track 
of if the computer has done what it is doing or not. Remember, the computer in itself is not that smart. The smartness of the computer comes in the speed in which it uses to process data and the instructions that are given. So in the scenario in which I gave, where I gave the scenario where we are going to be updating the numbers, right? So I go and pick a number eight and then I have to update it. I need to find a way whereby the computer will know that I am done. So that when it is done, then it will go and change the eight here to 10. That means that it will be more expensive because it means I have to write code and algorithm to keep track of that. The other one, there's nothing to keep track of. The other one, I'm saying that if you make a change, go and tell all the other people that you have made a change and change it over there. But for this one, it means that if I make a change, I have to note that I have made a change, note when the changes are done, and know when I should send the change. And it is more expensive. And it requires more detail. And if there is a mistake, it's difficult to see. So for each, there are pros and cons, but the way you will structure your computer is either a blend of the two, or you pick the one which will best suit you. But you must know the weaknesses of them. So over here, we have a table that shows what happens on the right. So on the right, data written to clash and to data written to cache block, also written to lower level memory. Write data only to cache, update lo lower level memory block falls out of the cache. The debugging is easy. We we'll write through. Write through every place gets updated. So if there's a problem, you know. Ah, you had any updates, okay. Over here, you have to keep track of what it is doing, how it is doing it, and all of those things. So it is very, very hard. Over here, if there is a miss, there is no need for you to do a write. Over here, if there is a miss, it means that you have to go back and check when there was a miss, what did I miss, what is going on, so on and so forth. Over here, if the data is the same, let's say I do an update, but the data is the same, it will go and update everybody. So we are just updating everybody over and over again. At some certain point, it becomes tedious and it becomes too long. But for this, we will update only once, so we don't continuously do updates. That brings us to the question of the read policies. So we have the read through policy, whereby we are saying that reading a word from memory to the CPU is the read through. And the no read is reading a block from memory to the cache and then to the from the cache to the CPU. So if I'm doing from main memory directly to CPU, then I'm calling it read through. If I'm doing main memory to cache, then to CPU, then I'm doing no read through. Such, in, such is not the case for writes. Modifying a block cannot begin using a tag. And as I said, we'll look at the tags and things when we come next week. So let me just leave that reading there. And then let's talk about the write policies. So the write policy are done when we have a hit. On write hit, often distinguish um, cache designs. Write through, then for, I've, I've explained the write through and the write back at length. So let me just talk about the advantages. So what is the advantages of write through? That is all the places will be updated, right? So over here, we are saying that read miss never results in writes to main memory. So we, if you don't find any data, we don't write to main memory. We, we just leave it because it's not already there. It's easy to implement. Main memory has the most current copy of the data because every time there's an update, we go and update the main memory. The disadvantage, as one, one of you said very, very well, is that it is slow. 
Because every time you have to go and update everybody, of course, it will be slow. Every write needs access to the main memory. The point of the cache is that we reduce the, the, the conversation with the main memory, and then our application can move faster. So if every time we have to go to the main memory, what is the point of what we are doing? And as a result, it uses a lot of memory bandwidth because every single time we have to update, data has to move, data has to be everywhere. Hence, a lot of data is used to do the processing we want to do. For the write back, writes occur at the speed of the cache memory. That is, the CPU and the cache memory are talking to each other. So if your cache memory is fast, your processing will be faster. Multiple writes within a block require only one write to the main memory. Obviously, we are only going to main memory when we are done with our results. So we don't talk to main memory that much. That's great. As a result, it uses less memory bandwidth, which is great. But it is harder to implement. And the reason why it is harder to implement is because you have to keep track of what everyone is doing. And keeping track of what everyone is doing, when they are doing it, how they are doing it, if they are done, if they are not done, is very, very difficult. Is very, very, very difficult. Main memory is not always consistent with cache. And reads that result in replacement may cause writes of dirty blocks to main memory. That is, you may be copying things to main memory, which should not be copying because an error happened further down the line that could not be caught. You could not keep track of. Do we understand today's lecture? When we appear here again next week in class, as I said, we will deal with all calculations that are involved with main memory. Your job is to read the slides and notes in which I sent you. I've already sent you the slides and the notes. And also, you are to create your groups. Please, um, there are some things in which I have to tell you about the groups that you are going to create. Um, for the groups you are going to create, make sure you pick your partner very well. 